my name's Travis Bell, and I direct, well, the last movie I directed was The Girl. I started in 2003 making amateur films, and then every movie I do, I take a step up in production value and actors, um, things like that. I started off with like Friends, like most independent filmmakers, and then started doing other casting with people that had experience and still friends. And, um, but then the friends ended up getting better at acting and just kept going from there. I do conventions. Uh, my next one is the Erie Frequency Film Toy uh, Comic and Pop Culture Expo, November 23rd, 24th, Niles, Ohio. Um, that's some of the stuff that I do is the making movies and running conventions. I'm Mike Trevisano. I've uh, been doing uh, filmmaking since 2003. Started out as just an actor. You know, I had a little small little extra feature role in a movie called Bigfoot. Right, John? Yep. Um, yeah. And uh, that first, I mean, I've always wanted to be an actor, and that first day on set was like, you know, I, I can do this. And I started going to a couple classes that Ray Such was putting on, North Coast Central Casting. And, Got a couple of smaller roles, and after being on set for a couple of uh, projects, I said, you know what, I'm going to start writing. And I wrote my first script and started producing, directing, and, you know, and here I am. You know, I've been doing horror films and suspense films. I actually did a romantic comedy. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm also part of a TV show, Midnight Movie, kind of like a generic Big Chuck a Little John. And then it should be coming to Time Warner, hopefully in June or July. They can find us on Facebook or MidnightMovie.net. But we're here to talk about producing horror films. And uh, anything you guys, get any questions right off the bat? Or if we can get rolling that way? Or can tell you some stories, whatever you want to know. How many producers in this room right now? Not one. One, you're... Okay. <laughs> well... I guess I'll start out with a, a quick uh, thing about producing horror films. The good thing about producing <clears throat> horror films is that it has its own crowd. Okay. <clears throat> Drama, suspense, comedy, which is probably the hardest to write because everybody has their own sense of humor. Um, you have to have something that's going to bring an audience to it, that's going to you know, make you want to see it. But horror, if it's a horror movie and you're a horror fan, you're in for it. You know, if it's bloody, you know, you, know, you got your, you know, you got the you know, blood, boobs, and booze. That's usually the three B's for horror films, you know. And it sells. You know, you don't have to worry about getting a name actor, you know, or, or to attract uh, an audience. You got a horror film, it's got its own audience, it's a fixed audience, so it's probably the easiest to produce. Nothing's really easy to produce, but when it comes to trying to market your film and get it out there to find an audience, I think the horror film is probably the easiest uh, highway to go. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, any, any making any movie is hard, no matter what genre it is, but as far as selling it, you have a built-in audience with horror, especially like these conventions and stuff. Um, you can talk to people and stuff like we're doing right now. And, you have a lot more, more interest in it than if, probably if you made a comedy. I, yeah. think. I mean, you, you walk by a table, if you're a horror fan, you walk by a table, you see a couple pictures or a, or a video, some guy's head half falling off and stuff, you're like, oh, sweet, you know, you're, you're interested right away. You know, you see an action movie, you see a car blowing up, you're like, oh, who's in it? You know, it's a big difference, you know. The horror film, you, they're, they're the most fun to make, you know. You can be more over the top and the bloodier the better, and, you know. That's what I've learned, is that it's just, more fun to make and it's just easier to get it out there and find an audience. Yeah, I'm just curious within the horror genre, have you guys found that certain subgenres of horror are more popular than others, like supernatural stories versus slasher movies? Versus well, I'm glad you asked that. It kind of goes in cycles. You got, you know, uh, you got your. Uh, so back with the Texas Chainsaw, you had your kind of gritty, grimy, you know, underground feel to it. Then it was uh, slashers, you know, uh, the bloodier the better. And that was kind of like, who can top what? You know, you got the Saw movies came out. It's like everyone had to just top it, which my, my opinion, you know, my personal favorite, and anybody who was at last year's uh, lecture, uh, my favorite type of horror is found footage. Now, people either love it or you hate it. But if it's done right, found footage, if it's done right, can be fantastic. And 
I think now, you know, like you said, the sub subgenres right now is kind of centering around that paranormal activity, supernatural kind of thing. But eventually, it's going to kind of go back to the bloodier the better. It's just kind of it, it's a revolving door. It's whatever's hot at the moment. But but I still say if it's done right, found footage, which is going to be one of my next projects, John. Um, is, 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 if it's done right, it's fantastic. Blair Witch Project, I think. People, some people hate it, and I can, I can understand why. People want to see blood and guts and a big payoff at the end. But the way it was done, the way it was marketed, pure genius. And you have so many people that try to do the same thing, and some have failed miserably, and some have done great. Grave Encounters is one. I highly recommend that. What is found footage? Found footage, like a, uh, like, a, yeah, like a home video, like uh, if you've seen Paranormal Activity. Um, Blair Witch Project, where it's not an actual studio made film, nice. different angles. It's from their perspective. You know? Like you found someone's home video, and this is what you, this is what's on it. Gotcha. Uh, if it's done right, what do you think, Travis? Yeah, those are interesting. But I'm also I'm into like science fiction too. Like my first film was science fiction, and then my last one was like can't be horror. But the next one's like science fiction horror that I'm going to work on in the fall. What did you think about it, Man on Rise? Like that. Yeah. Um, in terms of distribution, do you is each film you finish a separate process, or do you kind of have a relationship with someone where you know? Because it seems like you've you know been doing it kind of quickly. Um, do you have to just shop around every single time? Or? Well, in my personal experience with horror films, you don't. You you can be just fine doing the the convention circuit okay. and not really find a distributor. You have to find the right one. Now, my horror films don't have a distributor, but I was working with someone else on a film. It wasn't horror, it was an action movie. But the, the process of going through a distributor is yeah. just mind blowing. <laughs> it really is. I mean, it's like once it's in their hand, it's not even really your movie anymore. And that's the problem is that, yes, your ultimate goal is you want to find a distribution deal and you want to have someone market this across the world. That's great. But it's not. I don't want to say every time, but a lot of times it ends up not being your movie. It just well, depends on what, it, what you want more. How does it not be your movie? Well, I mean, they, uh, they, they don't change the movie. Perfect right? example is that the movie um, that I worked on was uh, about two hours, okay? And we, we had name actors come in, Michael Madsen for one, from Kill Bill and Reservoir Dogs, and tell you what, I've got some great stories about that. This character that you see in the movies, that's him. <laughs> and, um, but I learned so much just working with him for a week because I worked really close. I was assistant director on some of the scenes with him. And, and I had a close relationship with him for that week. And, and I learned so much. But back, back to the question is that it was a two-hour movie, but this, most dis distribution companies, you know, it's got me down to an hour and 45 minutes. So now you got to cut, 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 cut. They cut. Then, then it's like, well... You know, if you want to, if you want to get it on TV, it's got to be a uh, two-hour slot on television. It's got to be no more than ninety-three minutes. So you got to cut, 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 cut. Now who does so that's the cuts? You, have you a do lot the cuts. You have yeah. You do you most of the cuts, but, but it, just, it doesn't end up yeah. what you with, wanted. With what you wanted. Person. Now I understand. Hey, you want it sitting in your basement? You want it on television? So I get it. I get it. Yeah. But that's why you see a lot of these movies that come out with director's cut, and it's like an hour longer than the original cut. That's why. You know. Mm. So. But, but back to the horror films, you know, you could just do the, 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 the convention circuit and, and, and get your movies out that way because there's such a follow. How many conventions are there? Are they all, all year round and all? All year all round, all, all city, states, all, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do, you do conventions all over the place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I, oh, no, go ahead. I was just wondering how the... Uh, the internet has uh, assisted or otherwise in, in the distribution process. Um, well, you have Amazon.com, but I don't know how many sales. I mean, you're going to get some sales from that. Um, it, it's good. I mean, it's, it's good in that sense. But, like, um, I think now with, like, what you could do before, like, say you're making an independent film, you could go advertising magazines, like horror magazines. And um, you'd, you'd make money that way. You could sell um, and, and get stuff in like local mom and pop stores, things like that. If you didn't have a distribution deal, 
Uh, but now with the internet, it's kind of taking away the magazine, so it's kind of killing that too. So I don't know that it's helping maybe a little bit some people. What what I was wondering is is there any uh, we have network television stations. What's wrong? Why do we not have something on the internet that's comparable, like a like a horror? Um, website, for example, that's similar to a network television station. Well, there actually there are there are a few. Are there? But it's going to eventually merge. It's, anywhere yeah. you look at it, you're you're going to have an internet connection where you're going to have your television, you're going to have your internet, and it's all going to merge. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> uh, to the point where now, for with new mo new media contracts with SAG and everything, that they're actually in development for. Uh, uh, what we would have called television sitcom shows for the iPhone and for phones and that. And you actually pay for subscriptions. Like, you know, on your cell phone, you'll pick a subscription for that channel and you'll be able to watch those things. And, it, and now it's called new media. So I came late. What did I miss? Have you ever wanted to be an actor? At Cleveland Academy of Film Acting, anyone can get on the path to a new exciting film career. If you're new to acting, an experienced pro, or somewhere in between, Cleveland Academy is for you. We help place our students at local film projects. Classes are on Wednesday night from 8 to 10 p.m., and your first class is absolutely free. Call 216-323-2393. That's Cleveland Academy of Film Acting. Admit it. You're the one who killed him. You seduced him. Gained his confidence. And then when he wasn't looking, you reached into your purse, and without conscience or remorse, you pulled out a gun and shot him. And cut. Curious? Visit theindiegathering.com, a film festival, and so much more. Yourself, right? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I'm Ray Such. Uh, uh, I started the Indie Gathering 18 years ago as a, uh, a networking party for filmmakers uh, at a bar, at a bigger bar, at a nightclub, at a bigger nightclub until we had to move into a, um, a thing. And, and producing on a low budget. And regardless, I mean, even if, if you had $200,000 for a budget, which you know, means slow, but if for Ohio's tax incentives, that's $120,000 under their credit, so you don't get the credit, so, you know, they're $320,000 and above. Um, to do a $200,000 uh, production here or around here or in the Midwest, you know, you come out with a comparable million dollar project, uh, you know, on LA standards and everything, if you learn to produce skillfully. To give you an example, I, I had a friend that came to me who developed a CAD program for like, uh, uh, it, it started as a blueprint pro project, and then he developed this CAD program, color coding uh, signs in a school building like every room would have certain color sections, each room would have a number, color, and then there, each room off that room, even if it was a closet, would be number coded. Putting all that into a CAD program, and it, he called it SOS, Save Our Students. And he came up with the idea, and I loved it, and I said, you know what you need to do, you need to create an industrial, and an industrial, for those of you that don't know what it is, is, is either a training film or an aid film for, like, MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, mm -hmm. that, where we did an industrial showing the creation of their company. So he wanted me to do an industrial. So I had that idea, and I said, well, why don't you give the program to a high school? And he says, well, I live in Macedonia, so how about Nordonia High School? He went, talked to them, yes, we'll take the program. Then I went to the chief of police in the city, and I says, hey, look, the city, they're now going to use this, so your squad cars can actually punch up anything and everything, from electrical 
to a lot key boxes and everything. Um, you know, so like EMS, for example, where what entrance is the closest to this injured child or whatever? You understand? So it's a great benefit. So, okay, I went to the chief of police and I says, well, you know what? I got a bunch of stunt guys. I got a bunch of extras. So I'm gonna ha I'm gonna arrange and write up this where I have six uh, uh, terrorists come into the school and take it over <coughs> and everything. And uh, you can use it as a, like a training aid. He went ape over this. He says, I love the idea. And he and I says, well, you got the number to the chief of police? Ah, I got better than that. Got on the phone with the chief of, or the fire uh, chief. <coughs> yeah, we'll get involved with that too. Okay, so now I got two guys, two agencies using it as a training thing. Put it together. So the day of the shoot, I had five police cars and officers, a uh, SWAT van with SWAT locked and loaded. Well, not loaded, but all their weapons and everything in gear, and the full SWAT van. I had hook and ladders. Um, Fire rescue, three EMS units and the, and the EMS guys. Um, I had a hundred extras in an auditorium, and one of my women, uh, uh, one of my stunt women on on the stage talking uh, to this class, and they come in and everything, and didn't cost me one damn penny. It's how you approach. When you're talking for locations, you know, uh, you want to do a bar, a nightclub, you find either his slowest night and tell him you're going to bring him a damn cash bar. Think about that. I'll bring you a cash bar. All the extras and everything, drinks, cash bar. Um, sure, you get bars that that are not open on Sunday, but they have a license for Sunday. We'll bring you a cash bar. That's how I started the Indie Gathering as a networking party. Never paid a penny. I got huge nightclubs. Told them, whoosh, whoosh, they're going to come from three states. We're just going to come in here and have a blast and show the films up on the wall and everything. And it was free. So restaurant, same thing. You know, they're going to come. We'll buy meals and everything. You know, give you credit. When I, uh, I started um, North Coast Film Commission, and I started that um, a year ago, getting little cities, going to the mayor, talking to the mayor and saying, hey, look, this is a win-win situation. A filmmaker comes down here, he's going to do nothing but spend money. Even if you don't get a tax credit, you give them incentives to come down into your city. Well, Shelby was the first one in Ohio, outside of Mansfield. The second one now is Millersburg, between Cleveland and, and, and it's Amish and everything. And they've been setting up films left and right. And they, uh, maintenance man, they, they, you know, they wanted a, um, a restaurant, a school building, a uh, gas station, and a big old house that they could take a body out of. And they were so low budget, they didn't know if they were going to carry the body out or drag a body out, but they were going to do it. So the city sent them back seven or eight pictures of each one of the locations. Take your pick. That one, that one, that one, and that one. All right, one day. They made all the arrangements with the owners, free of charge, during one day to shoot. They were supposed to get to the house at midnight. Well, it's 1.30 in the morning. Everybody. Things happen over, under schedule. So they didn't show up to the uh, um, house till 1.30. Victorian, nice, big old house. It was the mayor's house. And 150 extras all waiting still. And four police cars and the officers to hold back the crowd like it's a neighborhood crowd and everything. <laughs> And an EMS unit with the Gertie and the EMS workers ready to go. And they were an hour and a half late. It was all free. The chief of police calls me and he says, when am I going to get to do a high-speed chase? 
it's how you approach people for locations, anything. Uh, in Shelby, Ohio, they have one of the largest military surplus places. You can go buy a half ton or a Jeep, okay? And you don't rent. I sat down with him, I said, well, let's talk about this. How much for that half ton? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, 48000 Well, if you go and rent it for the day, isn't it still 48000 Oh, yeah. He did it once. And he got to drive one of them. Now he's hooked. So he's, I'll work within whatever budget they have. Yeah, I think I'll get it to them, no matter what. I, they, they'll have the trucks or car, jeeps or whatever. If they write it in and want to do it, we'll do it. He's having a ball doing it. It's how you handle people. Don't you agree? Mm -hmm. How you approach locations. How you approach your extras and how you uh, 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 treat them. Um, how you approach and uh, treat your crew. You know, a lot of writers with the, you know, the indie gathering what we have here in August. I mean, we'll have 40 to 45 writers from all over the country come in. Just the writers. Uh, and uh, like I say, we film scoring. We had them from Dubai, Great Britain, everywhere. Uh, the stunt people from everywhere. The producers and directors from New Zealand, Canada come in here and everything. And it's just one big networking party. But they're all networking. The FX people here, one young lady's doing work, uh, but she hasn't done it for film yet. In your particular city, in a, if you shoot, how many here are, well, you're LA, so that's warm all year round. We're seasonal up here. Uh, who's, who else is around, around from around? Here, see, you know, so, you know, well, if you want to shoot next summer, come October, visit every one of the damn haunted houses. Hey, and you know what? You're going to be standing from here to here looking at that makeup and holy hell, that's good. We're not even doing camera angles. We're not even doing lighting. They have to actually be realistic as much as they can to scare somebody almost face to face. But they would love the opportunity to cross over and get the film credit. And a lot of times you just pay for the makeup and don't, they, they'll get on it. They want the IMDb. Actually, you might have to explain it to them. Look, get IMDb credit for it. You know, I'll pay for the makeup. But, you know, you start establishing yourself. Stunt people. I don't care where you go. Wherever you're at, you're not going to drive 10 miles before you find a martial arts school. Automatic fight scene coordinator. And then how many fight guys do you want? They'll pick his black belts. And if you're smart, you ask them to supply, to supply all your extras because they're martial art families. Shut up, sit down, don't problems. Oh, okay. You know, because extras can be nerve-wracking. Okay, so I covered extras with martial arts schools, stunt people with martial arts schools, FX makeup people getting them out of things, uh, out of uh, horror, uh, horror haunted houses, locations, how you talk to people. Um, writers uh, at the Indie Gathering, I encourage them, if they got scripts, you know, film a trailer, two minute trailer of your, you know, like, story outlined. Now, if I were to, if, you know, people give me scripts for producing it, but, you know, I don't got a lot of, I look at a trailer, well, hell, I want to read that. I would like to see that movie. That story, who did, you with the zombies that, who wrote, who wrote, anybody in here, the writer that wrote about a zombies, uh, a script? No, she's, she's not in this room then, uh, but she's here. But they actually <clears throat> communicate, talk to each other mentally, the zombies. No. You hear it, no. but you don't see them talking. No. And they're functional thinking, which makes them even scarier. 
So when you have concepts, something like that, and put it into a trailer, I think you'll encourage somebody to read it quicker. You'll give somebody a visual idea about producing your film. So that's for writers. All right, I'm about ready to shut up. treat your extras though like he was talking about it's really important when I started um, when I knew I wanted to make movies I was learning I didn't go to school for it so I learned off um, other filmmakers on, on what to do and how you treat your extras is it, really important um, if you even have just water for them snacks things like that because you're usually an independent film you know there's not a budget to pay those those extras um, so yeah just treat them treat them nice if you're gonna make a film and then they'll come back for you and be happy talk well about you the other side of that, Jason Tamaric lives in L.A. now, the movie won, I think it's renamed now, um, completely extra intensive. I had a battle scene at Perry High School where I had these people bringing their, taking the bed sheets, tearing them, turning them into ponchos, driving over them, throwing grease. They lived underground. They, they're breaking out at this modernistic building, which is a modern school, Perry High School. And uh, I had 1,200 of them coming over a hill to attack with mortars going off and everything. Uh, we shot underneath the terminal tower where they actually have dirt tunnels. And we shot down there, extra intensive. Um, every scene, extra intensive, extra intensive. I had a bunch of extras on it, and we were underneath the, the terminal tower and he says all right we're gonna break we're gonna have pizza and he went around getting everybody's order for pizza and everything and when the pizza showed up that'll be your eight dollars that'll be your he had them all pay for it didn't tell them they were paying for it we're getting pizza what do you what do you guys want oh, okay 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 ordered it delivered it made you pay for it another thing the Palace Theater in Cleveland. How many are familiar with that place? That Palace Theater, he had a premiere. He paid nothing for his film. It took him almost four years to do it on weekends. Paid nobody anything. Had a world premiere at the Palace Theater. Uh, seats were $20 a piece. VIP tickets were $100 a piece. And he filled the entire theater. Why? It was extra intensive. So every extra who's going to see themselves now brought mom, dad, grandma, and grandpa, and he had all these scenes. And he had to have made anywhere from thirty to forty thousand dollars at that. And he never released the film. To this day, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Are extras paid anything? Not for that film, they weren't. It all depends. It all depends. Um, who's, who's doing it? Give examples of some that are and some that aren't. Usually budgeted films. And budgeted films means this guy's got somebody else's money. Investors. And investors. And, uh, and, and so much is set aside for actors, extras, production assistants, different costs involved. It's easy to spend someone else's money. It's called burning the budget. Yeah. 
if this guy gives me $2 million and I got this much for extras, this is what you guys are getting paid. Even if you thought you'd do it for half, you're getting paid this. Because I, I, I do not want to go a penny over the budget. But then again, I don't want to give him back a million, and then next time I go to him and I'm only going to get a million, and he's going to expect the two million. I'd rather use the two million and give him a four million dollar picture, and then next time he's thinking, well, what if I give you three million? But it's in the budget. Filmmakers start as a student, and then they're student films. You know, I tell my actors, if you had a choice between being an extra in Captain America, or being a lead role in this short film. Fool, take the lead role in this short film. Well, I'm not getting paid for anything. Nobody's getting paid. No, but this filmmaker, 90% of the time, is going to take this film and submit it to film festivals around the world. Okay? And here's how I tell the actors, okay? No pay, $75 a day for 14 hours of work. Extra. And besides, you might be on the cutting room floor and not even be able to see you. Record. See that guy back there in the corner? That's me! But you better be watching it on a 10-foot screen to find him. But anyways, he's in that. So here's now this kid's in this lead role in a 20-minute short done by a, a Cleveland filmmaker Robert Banks who quite often gets invited to Sundance. So now your film's screening in Sundance. Or the other guy's an extra in uh, Captain uh, the Avengers. So here I am sitting in this uh, thing. I'm Joe Blow. I'm a ditch digger watching the Avengers. I figure out the ending. This place is jammed. And okay, I figured out the ending. Damn it, I want to get to my car before this whole place empties out. The kid that did the short, and this is how you talk to actors if you want them in your short. You know, encourage them. Tell them where you're going to go with film festivals and what can happen. I tell my actors, okay, now here's the audience at the film festival. You know, especially one that's like the end of gathering with all producers and directors. And this movie ends, and the credits begin to roll, and here goes the audience. I want to know who in the hell that sound man is. I'm not going to hire him. Or who's that lighting guy? I want to find out who he is. Or who's that actor? I want to find out who they are. And there's that actor's phone ringing two months later. Look at a part for you. Independent films are a lot of fun. You are beef on the set of, of uh, Captain America. You're going to have a PA that tells you what to do, where to sit, and sit and wait until we need you, and blah, blah, blah. It's going to look great, but you're a piece of meat. On an independent film that you might not get paid for, you're going to have a lot of fun. Something like that happened with me a couple of years ago. Um, I had a chance to be an extra in Spider-Man 3. I would have had to drive out to New York. Um, but then my friend, well, they were my friends at the time. They became my friends. But um, I had auditioned for this movie called Reunion, and I played this, this police officer. And I was only in a few scenes with that, but they were speaking lines and stuff. And so I chose that. I chose to be in Reunion. Never got released, but what it did is I, I became friends with the two people that were making the movie. They ended up helping make this movie. One of them edited the movie. The other one was my uh, DP on it. So um, I thought it can really work out, just like he said. Networking. You know. Meet the producers and directors. Go up to one of the tables and ask, and what's your capacity of filmmaking? Oh, I'm the producer. Oh, hi, yeah, what, what have you done? Yeah. Right, it all really depends on what they want to do. If they want to just have fun and take it serious, yeah, being on the set of The Avengers was great. But if you really want to become an actor, or producer, or director, take that role in that independent film. You know, and you learn so much. Just the first time that I was ever in a movie, 10 11 years ago. I learned so much just from that first experience. And then I vol I constantly volunteer for everything. I volunteer for these companies that will come in and shoot in our little towns. They want a stunt coordinator or they want somebody, uh, an acting coach on set, or they want somebody to wrangle their extras or this, that, or whatever. I volunteer to do it. 
I'll help them. I'll help a student filmmaker. Why? Because when I'm going to do my project, I like him to work the fourth camera operator. Because when I do an action scene, and I've helped everybody, oh, uh, guys, I'm doing one now. And I want you on camera one, you on camera two, you on camera three, you're up there on camera four, and you weren't the steady cam, and we'll organize this. And now if you ever do an action scene, and you've got four or five camera angles going, you don't have to retry to do that damn thing a dozen times. You may come up with everything you need because of four or five different angles. And that's how student filmmakers come back. I, I, I know filmmakers here that will help student filmmakers. And then in turn, they pick up a crew member on their teams. Networking is what this business is about. And I, I will not knock going as an extra to something big. Because one of my students, actors, uh, we told him, I told my whole acting class, hey, <clears throat> Pittsburgh, they're auditioning for the Dark Knight extras. But I read that this is also the woman who's doing minor parts. Not the major parts, but minor parts. But she's casting for extras. I said, you need to go to this audition for an extra because just in case, with whatever you look like, there might be another little part you get. One of my students called me, and his voice is, Ray, yeah. They want me for a six-day part in this prison fight scene riot in Dark Knight. Six days, and I train with the stunt people and the stars, and we're going to go through all this training stuff and everything. I said, God bless you in that. He was my only student out of 30-something in the class that drove to Pittsburgh for it. And then, of course, after they were all done, in the prison, in Pittsburgh shooting, they called him if they wanted to continue the role because they'll fly him into New York because see, as he breaks out of the prison, you're not in Pittsburgh anymore. They're filming in New York! <laughs> Do you understand? You could be in a room a room somewhere filming, a, uh, filming in L.A., and then you break out into this prison, which is in Pittsburgh, walk out the door, which is shot in New York. So he wound up with, I think, four more days in, in New York, all on a whim. So um, that's why that's, it's not Los Angeles. Somebody was smart enough to know it abbreviated to L.A., which abbreviated to La La Land. There's no rhyme and reasoning in what you can make or do. It's all based on budgets. And no budgets. Is there, most likely no budgets for the film, uh, independent filmmakers, but you get the opportunities. You know, that Civil War one I've done where... Uh, you know, reenactors would have dressed you, and you hear you would have been in the Civil War. You would have got a copy of it. So your grandchildren's grandchildren, I ah, mean, there's our great grandpa in the Civil War. It's a blast. In today's world, there is an absolute need to know how to protect yourself. But who has the time or money for lengthy training sessions with techniques you may not even remember in a time of need? or which can wind up putting you in even more danger. With the Escape and Survive seminars, you will learn effective and easy to remember techniques for getting out of dangerous situations. No complicated moves, no expensive, time-consuming training, just common sense, self-defense. Book your seminar today at escapeandsurvive.com. Time periods or just 
apocalyptic or uh, more apocalyptic. Yeah. I mean, I, I've done films where my students one week are in, in New York City in the 1950s behind some warehouses here in Cleveland, you know, with rolled up sleeves with their cigarette packs in it and everything, you know, looking like greasers against whatever, and young mafia people, and then the next week they're in the Civil War, and then the next week they're in the future. It's a blast. Anybody got questions and want to drill us on producing? Any ideas where we lead this discussion? <laughs> but, you know, communicating with other people. Both these guys are great friends of mine, and most of the filmmakers here are good friends, and even the ones that return year after year to the Indie Gathering. And they utilize me. I mean, you know, you, you were coming in from L.A., and you got somebody that was going to finance a film for $50,000, you know. Um, I'm guessing you could come out with uh, 300000 dollars project. And when you take that back to a $50,000, I don't care, $20,000, we'll set you up in a city that'll do whatever you want them to do. And you need the extras. They publicize it. The city publicizes it in the local paper and everything. Um, so $20,000 budget can give you a $200,000 film. And the process for that is then the investor going, damn, I wonder what if I would have happened if I gave him half a mil, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, Something like that. You came into town and said I had a $20,000, $50,000. I need the city. I need uh, action people. I need extras, intensive. I need locations. I need PAs. I'll volunteer. I'll find them. I'll volunteer to do whatever. You know, help produce uh, Rango extras to stunt coordinate. And, you know, and sometimes when you do that with an investor, you know, I've got Emmys in producing and I've got Emmys in stunt coordinating. So, you know, well, on my budget, I got a three-time Emmy winning, you know, uh, stunt coordinator, uh, you know, handling all the action and everything. And you're talking to investors and that's what they played the game. You know. Got a uh, question? Yeah. When you want to produce a horror film, how in the world do you come up with an idea of what you do? And just everybody's got tons of ideas in their heads. I think basically, it kind of goes off of you know what you've been influenced by. Or, you know, you write yours, movies. right? Yeah. For for me, it's what I want to see. What would I like to watch? Big <coughs> movie fans. So, uh, what haven't I seen before, or what did I see that could have been better if it was done a different way? I make right. mine based on what scares me the most, what frightens me. So that's how I wrote. I got two horror episodes that are screening tonight at eleven. If anybody's still here. Um, what do you mean after? That's before we go to the bar. Well, I'm just saying. It's 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, it's 11 o'clock. Uh, I got my two short uh, horror films that I did. I came up with the ideas and wrote them myself because that's kind of the stuff that kind of scares me. Or you might have a short script that you pitch to one of these guys and that, or, or a feature script and one of these guys, and instead of, you know, some writer saying, I, I, I want to sell this. <laughs> Millions of scripts out there, but sometimes, you know, you have to look on a process. Well, if I team up with this production company, we can produce it low budget, turn out halfway decent, might not make any money off of it, run it on the, uh, turn or the tournament circuit, I'm thinking of martial arts now, run it on the uh, festival circuit and everything, uh, somebody sees it, and realizes I didn't spend any money doing this. Gee, I wonder what you'd do if you did have money. And then he invent, and then you remake it. I'm doing an action film. I first did a trailer, and I had a film score in Dubai score the trailer. Then I also found out his family and everybody in Dubai is rich. So I mean, like you know. Mm -hmm. So making a long story short, I, I says I want to do a short introducing Christina as Lady Dragon, and would you film score? Yeah, absolutely, no problem, I'll do it for free, right? 
what he flew here, you know, whatever. So, fine. And he came up with the idea, how about after we get this, I, I talked to some of the family members about investing and in turning it into a feature. So it was, it was an idea, a short script, feature script, only shoot a trailer, shoot the short, and then have all the money for the feature. So it can be an idea. Or a writer can team up with a production company if he had the idea, and they do a joint um, I, I tell everybody here, I said, you know, I have this concept in my head of a story. Um, you know how you had everybody's done time travel? Well, how about if you got an old cop or a cop and you follow them through uh, finding dead bodies, naked, John Doe bodies, no finger, fingerprints don't match nothing, and he goes his career up and he's assigned to all these John Doe murders and it literally turns him into an alcoholic and his son becomes an officer and his son is working missing persons. And as he started getting missing persons, they're hitting the bodies, the prints. And in reality, a company that just discovered time travel, but not safe, just like an object, if you put a person in, you kill them. But he figured out he can kill people here, send the bodies into the past. He's using it as a dumping ground. So here you got Bunch of dead bodies. No, I, because they haven't been born yet. And then here, missing person, and then he teams up with his father to discover whatever company created this way to send something back. I'm going to watch that someday. <laughs> I'm not a writer in no way, shape, or form. Um, but see, that's a, technically a concept on time travel nobody's thought of. Just using the machine in the future to dump bodies in the past so they're not there now, but they're there then, but they're not going to be any good then, blah, blah, blah. So, go ahead, run with it. Whoever you are, you got my permission. <laughs> not that I have to come. How do you pick your... Uh your sound guy. <clears throat> Word of mouth between people and the filmmakers, seeing his projects, seeing a demo reel he, he, he gives. A lot of times that's who you work with. If you work with somebody and you kind of, from a list of, you like them, you like what they do, then you kind of start working with them and you know who to go to. Same thing with the cinematographer. It's almost the same thing. Well, if you don't know them. anybody, you well, then get your music out there. Are you a, a sound person? And you haven't worked on any films yet? I'm trying to get my stuff. Well, you know who Christine is at the table? I will. Bruce. Okay. <laughs> me, Ray, grab me, introduce you, introduce you, introduce you, introduce you, introduce you, introduce you, and then you network. Networking can, can build. The gentleman back there is a producer from LA. I'm a producer. He's a producer. He's a producer. The production company you see sitting here, sitting there, sitting there, sitting there. Uh, you don't have any offices, do you? Okay. We're production companies when we need them. We're producers. And then everything comes together when we're going to do something. Well, that's from networking and connections. And that's what these people are here for. And again, the Indie Gathering in August, they're from all over the world here. Uh, anybody here in FX? I had an FX guy three years ago at the uh, Indie Gathering doing the competition. He got hired that day uh, for a horror film. And he came up to me and thanked me for introducing him and everything. And he says, this is a hell of a good budget, man. And he says, I don't have all the particulars yet. But when he did call me, I could hear it in his voice, he was calling me from a cruise ship in the Caribbean. They were filming on the cruise ship. So that pay 
plus feeding, and he gets to cruise with it. So it's a crazy world, but it's networking, meeting people. Hey, Ray, you might, uh, I'm from Cleveland, I know Cleveland does a 40 hour film festival. Oh. <coughs> and you can go, if you Google 40 hour film festival and look at Cleveland, find out and get on the email list. Yep. They always are looking, they'll be yeah. looking for team members. That's a great way to get your foot in, get people to know you. Because <coughs> as a filmmaker and a producer, I'll tell you that. I think that the sound guy is almost more important than the camera guy. Yeah. Because of the, the, the shitty sound. And you again, you can world. you can email either myself or Christina from our website or, or ask us here. And we can tell you about the 48 hour. And the four, if you're a filmmaker and even an experienced filmmaker, the 48 hour film festival in your city is like, well, in Cleveland, it's like the lotto. You're buying one of 40 tickets because one winner from each city go on to film a Palooza, which is a well-known attached film festival to other film festivals and cash prizes, but big networking too. So if you ever do enter 48-hour film festival, wind up, wind up the best in your city, you go on to film a Palooza, which is like a lotto, and you won. It's tough. It's tough, it's very, it's tough to win it's film very, a Palooza very, on a national or a world level at their event, but you know, I think only the U.S. has only <coughs> won it once what or twice. What I meant is that it's just tough just getting a good product out there for you. It's very fun, and I recommend it, but it, it, it's, it's tough. your question about sound. Are you talking about audio for film? We're talking about music. Scoring. 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 Okay, you know what? Make a little sample. <clears throat> this, <clears throat> what's what's easy Pass them out on the tables. You know? or, or you'll meet some scorers here today or tomorrow, today and tomorrow at the awards that scored a trailer and entered competition. And we also have the scoring for the uh, international uh, indie gathering in August is still open. You can go download a unscored with the verbal in there and everything, you know, two, three minute clip, score it, send it, uh, enter it, and then the winners are awarded here in front of producers and directors from all over the world. Where, They're going to listen to your that? score. <laughs> where? <laughs> it's crazy. It's it's somebody, it's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Find me. But I agree with the musical score. I put so much emphasis on that in the projects that I do. That means that is almost half the battle. If you, you, music is so important to, to, to a movie yeah. and to a scene. I mean, I've seen movies where there's like no musical score at all. It's like it, it, music just draws you into the scene. I, I put so much emphasis on that in anything that I do. So 
uh, make a make a nice little demo. But please, yes. don't come up with original song and put music to it. Scoring is the sound of the visual you're seeing. Absolutely. The mm -hmm. impact of what you see and mm -hmm. what you don't see and what is smooth and what is rising up. To score anything, you score what you see. When somebody sees a film, they hear it, they see it. The, the scoring is just there, but it blends and it fits. And too many young, um, uh, I don't want to use the word, but musicians or whatever, or singers and musicians, singer mu musician, they put their songs in and that, and they don't score it. Take different. Scoring is different. Again, it, go, it goes back to, and, and I'm not saying you in general being wrong, but even with that casting process, you chose that person, you know, um, again, casting, you know, a lot of the producers and directors, uh, I cast for the sake of casting as a casting director. A lot of people will cast their friends, relatives in films, that's chaos. I did a, uh, uh, a training series, which you can find on the uh, internet, it's called uh, uh, Escape and Survive, mm -hmm. Common Sense Self-Defense for Women. And they're all moves that any woman can watch, learn, and do it tomorrow uh, without learning any martial arts or anything. And I had four scenarios where she's tr uh, she's in the feet, in the street or somewhere at a bar or whatever she gets into trouble stop we go to the studio we train her what to do go back show it a little bit now she's in trouble boom she lays the guy out then I did four of those so we had different locations around the city I had I had two teams uh, two unit were shooting the outside while I was shooting the training parts inside. Then we had questions and answers afterwards and things like that. Uh, I did the whole two half hour shows or videos in one weekend uh, with eight locations in the field, two teams going around for two days. And I was never, with, the, with my production, I was never more than five minutes off. And then of course, on Sunday, the last day, I was a producer enough to schedule the last shoot was a nightclub bar scene where we had a rap party. <laughs> so shot the last scene, that was a rap. And we had the rap party then. So scheduling who you pick for a for a part. Follow up question to that. To you Particularly, you have an amazing array of talent that you've used in your movies. How do you get them? Um, when I first started, um, well, in, in 99, I went to this huge convention in New Jersey called Schiller Theater, and um, I did security there. And, you know, and I went, I talked to different people, and there was guests, and um, just the same as like the Indie Gathering, you, you talk to them, and they're regular people like everybody else, but they, they've got huge resumes of, of, of work, and um, you just give them your number, they give you their number. Um, it started there, and uh, it just built on that. Um, then I started doing my own conventions, talking to more people, and then I, I started getting them into the films as well. So um, I've got people from Star Wars in my movies, um, just mm -hmm. all, all kind of Friday the 13th, all, all kinds of different. I was in that segment, if you remember. I was yeah. sitting at the bar with Alan yeah. Drago. <laughs> yeah, Michael Shear. <clears throat> yeah. Or if you just even find a nobody, put them in your film and they find out they're a somebody. They did yeah. great. And then you just keep their information. And then then you go, somebody like him or him would go back and write that character into their short or their feature or whatever, knowing that they had somebody they knew nothing about, showed up, did a great job, reliable, everything, did it, you know, and then they, so they keep those. Actually, if you really see some of the independent filmmakers, when they're doing shorts, 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 and features, you might start seeing a conglomeration of these actors, like the, wow, he, his first short, man, that guy's good. Next short, well, that woman's really good. 
neck short. There's the man, there's the woman, neck short. You know, feature. We learn, too. We take gamble when we cast, a lot of gambling. Having a whole crew on hand and one person don't show. Can't do it. So do you go into movie uh, casting with a script uh, concept in mind, like what this character is, looks like, acts like? Do you cast for that then? Well, if I'm casting as a casting director, I get into his head what he wants. Okay. And then using an unbiased system, I will pick some of the five or six of the best that fit into that particular character and send them to him for his approval. But uh, if I'm casting for my own, I have to be biased, man. I mean, you know, uh, I do the same process. But um, I, you know, I've had uh, a SAG film. They had one main character was uh, a Caucasian female. They had the casting call at my studio, and the whole day, one African American female showed up. I want to audition. They rewrote the part for her. She was the best of what they saw, and they rewrote the part. Uh, anything's possible in this business. What do you uh, think is, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, we're fine. Yeah. Yeah. But what do you think is the biggest problem with today's horror films? Is it like lack of originality, or sometimes I see films that are trying to substitute shock value for horror. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's like, like I was said in the beginning, it's just, it, 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 it's going to go in cycle because it gets to the point where it's just a run of the mill. This, we can be over, we can top this, top this, and top this, and then someone's going to come up with something that, different than that, and that's going to become hot for a while. I think that's the problem. Or just, you just find just so follow the time. leader film, you know, all of a sudden this concept comes out, so everybody's doing it, you know, trying it, you know. You guys can do yourself. Well, yeah, the thing I don't like are like the remakes. I mean, the only one I think I liked was years ago is the Dawn of the Dead remake, which I mean, the original Dawn of the Dead, I, I partial to because I love it, but I thought that was good. But I just watched a movie a few days ago. It wasn't horror, but they did some of the same shots I'd seen from another movie, and it just kind of didn't have kind of ruined. I don't know. It just wasn't as good. Yeah, I don't, I'm not crazy about remakes, but a couple of them are okay. The Texas Chainsaw remake, I really was fond of. The one with Jessica okay. Biel. The one with, the one with Jessica Biel. Um, yeah. That one was well done. But you know, the problem is that you take you take a classic that you just there's you know you love. You're always going to compare it. You're always going to compare it. So that's the problem. So, I don't know. What time is the acting one? We're doing another one on the acting. Come come for that one. I think was that three? Yeah, it might might be three. I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll be here that time. But come, come back for that one, because that one's going to be fun. I got some storage for that one. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming.